Thank you so much. I am really honored to be here, and uh, you have no idea how excited I am. Um, as uh, my dear brother here, Ron, mentioned, I am a former Muslim from Saudi Arabia, and if you know anything about Islam, you know that Saudi and Islam are synonym. It's one and the same, and you cannot be from Saudi and not a Muslim. And obviously, I grew up that way. I believed with all my heart that that's the way to heaven. And never ever that I doubted my faith, never ever that questioned why I believed in what I believed in, simply because I never had the opportunity to hear the gospel. And it wasn't until I got that opportunity and the door opened up for me to come to the States to pursue my graduate education in engineering. And I remember that for the first time after studying English for most of my life, I realized that in the US, they do not speak English at all. <laughs> what they speak is Americanese and you need all the help that you can get. And it was in the first month that I realized I needed help with idioms. People will ask me simple questions. What's up? And I would look up immediately. <laughs> I had no idea why people are concerned about what was up there. Sometimes they ask me about how is it going? And I'm like, define the it for me and I'll tell you how is it going. <laughs> people want to pull my leg. <laughs> They tell me not to open a can of worms, and I have no idea why they're talking like this to me. <laughs> and it was because of this simple thing that I was forced really to seek help. And I reached out to one of those campus ministries and they connected me with a born again believing family. And that was the first time ever that I began to see Christianity from a born again perspective. The biblical Christianity not the one that I assumed it to be. And God used a very simple couple, not theologians, not apologists, loving Christ, living Christ, and sharing Christ, not just in deeds, but in words as well. And the seed was planted. But I severed my relationship with them after I moved from that place where I was to Arizona State to continue my education and we never ever connected again. But the seed continued to grow through challenges, spiritual dialects. Sometimes I wanted to invite people to Islam and all of a sudden we are faced with the dilemma of trying to explain our positions and as they would share their faith with me, I began to develop a better understanding of their argument. Not that I was convinced, but I realized that there is more to the story of Christ than meets the eye. And that journey took 12 years and finally materialized in 2001 when I accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And at that time, I continued with my engineering, uh, basically, career. And never ever crossed my mind that I will be a full-time minister and a missionary. At some point in 2007, my media side of the ministry took off and I began to share my testimony and other teachings on satellite programming that airs in the Middle East. I remember even a Saudi woman accepting the Lord when I first shared and a few months later her parents discovered that and she ended up being killed as a result of this. That sent a shocking basically wave of reality to me, making me realize that there is a cost to be paid. And we ought to count that cost. But I also began to seriously ask the Lord for guidance if he really wanted me to be in ministry or not. And that's when I knocked on the door of the seminary and I pursued my Masters of Divinity. Now, it's kind of interesting, by the way, you hear my name is Al Fadi. It's actually short for Abdul Fadi. And that's Servant of the Redeemer. However, Courtesy of media, they butchered my name and they called me Al-Fadi thinking my name was Al. The only problem is Al-Fadi in Arabic is the Redeemer. Because the Al is the definite article. <laughs> and when I got a Master's of Divinity, I said, well, the package is complete. I am a divine master now. <laughs> so you have everything you need right here. <laughs> It wasn't until 2010 when the Lord closed all doors for me in uh, basically engineering. If you remember, the economy wasn't doing well at all at that time. And I knew and realized that it is time. 
and that's when we launched CIRA International, or C-I-R-A, and I am so thankful that the Lord has been blessing us with wonderful opportunities like this. My ministry has media aspects to it. We utilize social media as much as possible. Facebook, we utilize YouTube, we utilize satellite programming, podcast, you name it. It's an amazing thing, indeed, that we can use technology to reach the masses. And in addition to that, of course, there are many other aspects of my ministry. You can always go, of course, and check it out. But why I'm here today is to share a few encouraging words with you. Now, one thing that caught my attention, and anytime I go to a place, I like to do a research on that place, and what caught my attention about your mission statement is the following. It says that Westmont College is an undergraduate, residential, Christian, liberal arts community serving God's kingdom by cultivating thoughtful scholars, grateful servants, and faithful leaders for global engagement with the academy, church, and the world. And the word global engagement, or the phrase global engagement, is what caught my attention. And I said, what would make any minister have a global impact? What's the key to do this? And I want to remind all of you that to be a global minister today, in the 21st century, in 2019, is no longer a requirement for you to sell everything, and leave and go overseas. You can be global at this very moment by using your smartphone and using social media platform. We have tools and means that are available at our disposal. We also have the world at our backyard. That's global. So how can we make an impact in the life of those that never ever had the chance to hear the gospel or maybe have misunderstandings about the gospel as it was the case with me? So I'm going to give you a few points, hopefully within the time that I have. The first point of making us effective in global ministry is to remind ourselves of this virtue, patience. Without patience, you are not going to succeed because you are going to give up and drop everything and be discouraged and walk away from whatever the calling that was given to you. But I also will take a number of things for us to remember. How would this patient look like? Patience means that we need to extend grace to others. We have to be gracious to them. We cannot expect and demand perfection from people, something that we ourselves cannot even attain. We have to work with those that the Lord either bring into our path to work with or work for. We need to humble ourselves. We need to remember that things don't happen just overnight, that it is not all about us, that there is a much bigger power that can accomplish things through us. We're just a tool in the hand of Almighty God. Another reminder is that we must be committed to a long-term ministry. Without patient it is impossible for you to be committed to something that is long term. The family that God used to reach out to me have been doing this ministry for many years among many students. And my relationship severed with them in 1990 and it wasn't until 2008 that we reunited again. And you know what I discovered? They have given up on ministry because they thought it wasn't working. And when they realized that God used that simple seed to flourish and to grow in my life, and the impact they had on my ministry, and as a result of this, the impact on the world through the ministry that I'm involved in, and mine is just one of many, only then they realized that we serve a God that can do things except it is on his own 
timetable. One other thing that we have to remember that we have to wait upon the Lord. To wait upon Him to accomplish the things that He entrusted to us. And I have to tell you this sobering reality, by the way. It is a privilege when God shows us the fruit of our ministry. He doesn't owe it to us. Oftentimes, many of us will pass before we even realize the impact that our ministry have had. If we are paying attention to results, fruits, and numbers, you are going to face a sorry reality. You may never ever appreciate the depth and the impact of your ministry, and you are going to disappoint yourself. So serve with faithfulness and leave the rest for God. Another point I want to remind us of what makes us effective global ministers is growth. And I'm not talking just about your growth, your spiritual growth, but I'm talking about also realizing who brings the growth to your ministry and the impact of your ministry. It's not you. It's not those who are working for you. It's not those who are working with you. It is God himself that brings that growth. That's another sobering reality for us to realize that we are nothing without him. It is Paul who said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. In fact, I love it when I read in that very chapter and the chapters to follow that Paul couldn't even remember how many people he baptized and he can only remember two people. This is the same Paul that God used to write almost half of the New Testament. And 2,000 years later, we are still preaching from the divine and the inspired word through the mouth of the Apostle Paul. But he couldn't remember how many people he baptized. That's the heart of the minister who is focused on the mission and ignoring numbering and enumerating things. But in a little bit, I'll show you what kind of things he was keeping track of, actually. Not the positives, but the things that he had to suffer and endure for. Always remember that God is with you. And he promised this. And I will be with you until the end of the age. The God that walks with you will bring about growth to your ministry. Now, here's another thing that I know we don't like to hear about. Suffering and sacrifices. And I'm not talking about the suffering and sacrifices that people like myself had to endure and others who have left everything. I lost everything, by the way. And I can sit here for hours telling you about the things that I have lost and endured as a result of my decision. But did I regret following Christ? Absolutely not. And I can summarize to you what the Apostle Paul himself said in Philippians chapter 3. I consider it all rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ my Lord. That's what ministry is all about. So you need to be of the mindset that ministry comes with a price. And ministry has its challenges. I remember walking into ministry thinking that when I'm working with Christians, it's going to be like heaven. Boy, was I sorry to think that way. <laughs> and was I surprised. We are all human. We're all sinners in need of God's grace in our life. Our Lord told us the following, greater love has no one than this that someone lay down his life for his friends. This is my wife's life verse. She watched Christ in the passion of Christ say this, and she became a believer in Christ as a result of this. That's the sacrifice that touched her heart. Are you prepared to suffer for the lost? Are you willing to compromise and sacrifice things? Folks, I left engineering, a lucrative job, a high-paying salary, benefits and bonuses for a job that the Lord says, join my team. I don't know if you're going to make it every day or not, but you'll get your needs. No benefits, no bonuses. Would you sign here, please? And I love it. 
and I won't regret any moment of it because I work with a faithful boss who will never leave me or forsake me. That's what ministry is all about. I, I told you uh, Paul couldn't remember how many people he baptized, but look what he did when it came to his affliction for the sake of serving the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 21 to 28, I'm not going to read all of it, of course, Paul was actually making his case to the church in Corinth that there are those babblers, there are those false teachers who are claiming to be servant of Christ. And they're trying to compete with me. And they say that they're Hebrews. I am one. They say that they're Israelites. I am one. They say that they are descendants of Abraham. I am one. But are they really servant of Christ? Because this is what it takes to be a servant of Christ. Far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. How would you like to have this in your resume? That's what Paul was keeping track of. He's saying, if someone is claiming to be a servant of Christ, bring it on and show me how much suffering did you endure for the sake of our Lord. That's the legacy that we want to leave. Every time I read that he was stoned once, I always say, if that would have happened to me, I would retire, write a book, it'll become the bestseller, and everybody will ask me to come and speak for them. <laughs> and no one will ask me about ministry anymore. Not Paul. Number four, we need to acknowledge our weakness. Why? Because in weakness, the power and the strength of our Lord becomes extremely visible. When Paul appealed to the Lord three times about the thorn in his side, in the flesh, I should say, he says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's the kind of power we ought to seek in ministry. Realizing that we are weak to the point that only his power can keep us going. And you are going to need that power. Rest assured of that. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone wants to follow me, he must first deny himself. How often do we think about denying ourselves and our identity? It's not easy. We all struggle with that. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, then follow me. In a few minutes that are left, I want to leave you with this. So what's the point? We need to remember the task. Each one of you will have a task. What is your task? To share the gospel of Christ. Anywhere you go. I teach business as mission. I teach other business classes. And I always remind my students, even in business, you are a minister for Christ. People around you will know you by how you act, that you follow someone different than the one they follow. And that will open the door for the gospel. What is your, our qualifications? We're a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You're new. You're no longer the old self anymore. You are an ambassador. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. But we must recognize the urgency of the message. Why are we ambassadors? It's the same letter says that God making his appeal. Notice the language. There is an urgent message and God is appealing to the world through us. Reconcile to God. That's what ministry is all about. Thinking of those that have yet to reconcile to God. Thinking of those that do not have peace with God in Christ. Thinking of those that are truly lost. Do we not want to see him to spend eternity in the presence of our Lord? Loving them without sharing the gospel is like loving them all the way to hell. Loving people does not save. It is the word of God that saves. And that's what we need to do. Political correctness does not save. It is the boldness and the truth of the word of God 
that saves. That's what we ought to carry with us. Now, the scripture says we ought to share the truth in love. We should not fight people. We cannot really convince people. Only the Holy Spirit can do this. Finally, I want to remind you of the mission field that you're serving. What is the message? The message is given to us. The appeal is being spoken through us. The message of reconcil uh, reconciliation with God is being delivered through us as his ambassadors for this simple reason. Because Jesus, for our sake, was made to be sin, even though he did not know sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. The free message of grace that will bring us back to the presence of God and reconcile us with him. And here is the opportunity. God is on the move, and he moves people around everywhere. I did not come from Saudi all the way to the U.S. by accident. God didn't scratch his head and say, bummer, that wasn't the place I was thinking about him. How did he end up there? No, God has a plan for my salvation. In Acts chapter 17, 26, it says, And he, God, made from one man, Adam, every nation of mankind, everyone you're going to meet, comes from Adam, we are all relatives. Think of him that way. And why? He made them to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, and that they should do what? They should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. The tripart message, why God moves people around us and why he bring us into their territories because God has a heart for them. And I pray that you too will develop the same heart. May the Lord bless you. Thank you. Thank you for your message. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When we consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, all that you have created, which you have set in place, what are we that you are mindful of us, that you would even care for us? Thank you for expressing your love to us not only by your creative and sustaining acts, but most importantly by sending Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to save us from our sins. As we've heard Al-Fadi's powerful testimony of coming to faith in you and being transformed to love others and serve you, we're reminded how much you love all people, regardless of their culture, religion, social, or economic status. In particular, I pray that our hearts will be filled with love and compassion towards Muslims. I pray in faith and confidence that you, the triune God, will hear our prayers and move powerfully in answer to our prayers that the world might know you. Lord, you have made yourself known in the dreams of many Muslims, and many already have come to a saving knowledge of you because Jesus has appeared to them in their dreams. We pray that Muslims will have a revelation of who you are, of the true God, as one who laid down his life for us, to take away our sin, to restore us, and to forgive us through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that through Jesus we move from being servants to being sons and daughters of the living God. We pray that Muslims will know that you desire everything and everyone to follow you and to be your children, not your slaves. May your spirit work in the spiritual lives of Muslims as you have in Al-Fadi and his family to enliven and to redeem, to open eyes that once could not see so that you can create new life. In the precious name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.